Okay, for you people watching the show, this is Gordon Einstein, your favorite semi-local Dubai crypto attorney, actually licensed in California, but living the life here in Dubai. You wouldn't know it, but this is our third time trying to record this because we're dealing with technical issues, but I know third time is the charm. It's worth it, though. Why is it worth it? Because we have a very good friend on with me right now, uh, Dr. Anjo Dolly, who I'm thrilled to have on the show. I've known Angelo for years. I've known him mostly in the context of Malta and AIBC and those events, but he's he's blessed Dubai with his presence during this Ramadan. I don't know if that's edgy or not, but there you go. Uh, and I'm, he was kind enough to agree to come on the show. So uh, Dr. Angelo Daly, I'm very happy to have you come. And I would also like you to introduce yourself and explain why there's a doctor prepended to your name. So please. Such a pleasure to be here, Gordon. And, uh, you know, checking out Dubai, and uh, yeah, so I've been in AI and artificial intelligence for many years. So I've done my PhD 20 years ago and uh, I've always been in software. I've been selling software since I was a teenager and always been fascinated by computer science. And I could see how AI is going to evolve and affect human life and be integrated in our society. So this was something that fascinated me and that's why I studied it deeply. And uh, I've literally spent most of my career just applying AI in different industries, in the gaming industry, in retail, in analytics, in the transportation industry. And it has been a fascinating journey. And uh, I'm happy to have studied it at a deep level so that then I could apply it commercially, not just academically and inventing algorithms, but also applying it to multiple different applications. Lovely. And dare I ask, what was your thesis? Oh, yeah, it was actually on uh, on the internet on handling the aspects of text changing over time. So this was way back in like 2001. And uh, I had to actually build a cluster to hold an entire copy of the internet. So I had a copy lying there of all the text. No, not, not the, you know, not the pictures, not the videos, um, just text of the internet. It was 21 terabytes compressed back then. This was, okay. we're talking 20 years ago. Nowadays, it would be like much, much bigger. And it was actually quite interesting. How do you download the internet? So that was like my first challenge on how you realize how much data AI needs once mm -hmm. you realize, okay, in order to train this, I need to download the entire internet. And from then onwards, I realized, okay, AI is going to be something special, something unique. It is very data hungry, very resource heavy. But the results you get, you just can't get any other way. Interesting. Uh, wow, there's a, there's a there's a lot to unpack there, and you were you were very pressing. Now, how? I mean, just to jump into the obvious, here, here we are in 2024, and maybe starting the end of 22, but really in 23, and definitely continuing to 24, we're seeing things move fast, and they're moving fast on a commercially accessible level, which we can only guess, or maybe you know what's going on behind the scenes with the industry and military and, and governments. I mean, by the, by the time it comes to guys like me, it, you know, it's already been available to those guys for years at a much higher level. So what is going on that this has now exploded? Oh yeah, so AI has been always held back just because of the unavailability of data, also the hardware. But this has changed in the last five, seven years. It has changed dramatically. So the hardware is finally here so that you can process things. You can also have a lot of data. I mean, nowadays we have data all the time being generated. So we do need AI in order to process it. And I think that everyone has become familiar, thanks to systems like ChatGPT, what AI is all about. Just up to two years ago, I had to explain what AI is all about to people. Nowadays, at least I don't need to explain myself. Everyone knows about it. Um, and I think that the new applications that are coming out are more accessible by everyday people. You don't need to be an expert to use it. It's not so cumbersome. There are still problems to the adoption of AI, but I think it is changing and we're seeing more and more useful applications that you use every day. And this is how things become mainstream. Once you start using it for absolutely everything and you have a wide range of people using it, this is when I think AI finally is here to stay. It's interesting to note that AI, there have been a number of attempts to integrate AI, you know, in large mainstream society, basically. There were already two failed attempts, one in the 80s, one in the 90s, and they didn't really go anywhere. 
just you know from the lessons that were learned over the years the new breed of ai kind of tries to avoid the mistakes that were made for example having systems that need too much human input and involvement in order to train them so one of the things that we're going to see is is that a mistake or is that just a bottleneck of the time I think it was a combination of both. I think it was a combination of the people being too ahead of their time. Basically, the algorithms, the computer science behind it has not changed much. For example, I've created my first neural network in 1997. Mm. Not much has actually changed algorithm-wise since the 90s, but you know the way you implement it, the libraries you use, the hardware you use is different. So now it works much better than it did back then. Mm-hmm. However, um, there's all, there was always um, this tension kind of of what you could do and also what people imagined you could do. And this continues up to the present day. There is a lot of hype. People's imagination obviously runs a little bit ahead of what the systems could actually do. And uh, it's interesting, in fact, to see this interplay of what you can achieve and what we're going to be about to achieve. But I... There, there is also the opposite thing, which is we're, we're so used to the hype cycle and things taking longer than they should. I mean, you know, we still don't have our flying cars. We don't still have real robots walking around the street. We don't, we're not living to 120. We're so used to that that I, I think, you know, there's the opposite of it, which is we're used to downplaying the significance or the speed of things. Yet AI seems to be a little bit of an exception in that it actually is moving quickly. And it doesn't yes. seem to be an illusion. Maybe, maybe we're maybe we're making a mistake on the other end. Maybe we're we're underestimating it, and we're maybe you know to use the usual. I'm sure you have lots to say about this, but maybe maybe AGI isn't 30 years away. Maybe it's three or five years away. Especially the start start. Especially if the AI start working on themselves. You, know, you get this combinatorial explosion. And who, who knows? So, are we are we actually exaggerating it? I I, I don't know. Yeah, there there is a lot of hype. And uh, unfortunately, you know, some of the hype is in the wrong place. Some of it is in the right place, actually. But um, basically, this has been something that has plagued the AI all the time. So once you have something that learns on its own, people start imagining things and hyping it up. And, you know, for some of it is for the right reason. For example, you know, the driver assist systems in vehicles. These have made a big impact, in fact, on reducing the number of traffic incidents um, uh, and also making things safer. Yet we don't have the full, what is called level five, like fully automated driverless cars. And I think that there has to be quite a lot of development left in order for us to actually have that full level of automation. And you know what, maybe we'll be happy with like just a good level of, of automation. We'll still maybe need to pay a little bit of attention to the road and that will be useful. So I think that the way to do it is to have good enough applications and not like shoot for the most incredibly automated stuff that is totally work of science fiction yet. I don't think this is going to be remain the case. So bit by bit, I think people are gonna get there. Um, and part of the problem is that we do not yet have an architecture that can support AI that can work on any general problem. So. We're already seeing robots being applied in limited applications in warehouses and industrial settings. And we will see more and more of this technology in everyday life in household, for example, applications and also in commercial applications. I think this is the way to do it, to iterate on it. But you could see like, for example, from where I stand, there's a new invention, literally every three days, there's something new in AI. So you can see it. I mean, it takes time to actually build something totally new. And people also have to process, how do you work with this new technology? How do you interact? How do you control it? How do you actually make it safe and trustworthy? There are a lot of questions which are yet unanswered, and this makes it an exciting time to be. Well, l- l- all right, let me, let me push on that. Yes, it takes time to develop something new, but you've been doing this over 20 years, so you have a lot of time doing this. That's number one. And n- number two is... Sure, it takes time to develop tools, but now AI is developing AI. So maybe our linear brains on timelines isn't quite as applicable. I'm not, I'm not saying I believe all this. I'm just, I'm just saying it's much more possible. 
look, it, it's one thing to build physical things and iterate physical things. That takes time. You have to, you have to machine a plant, you have to prototype, you have to test, you have to scale. And then when you want to do it all over again, you have to decide whether you're going to make incremental changes or, or redo the entire factory floor. And maybe you have to do a whole new factory and your supply lines that did that. Software is highly iterable, but it was always constrained by your installed base and the talent you had and change tracking and technical debt and all that other stuff. When you, when you start applying AI to those things, I think every constraint doesn't go away, but it's minimized and it can learn iteratively quickly. And then, you know, it's all the stuff, you know, and then share that information broadly. It's not like a new bunch of students have to go to college and take four years before they catch up. It's like, it's immediately shared. So I, 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 I just, I just don't know. And, and that's comment number one. Comment number two is, you know, if, if you look at our brains, it's, it's not one homogenous mass. We have specialized areas. So just because one AI is good at one thing and one AI is good at, at nothing, I, I don't know if that's actually a limitation because in our brain, different parts are good at different things. It's not like, you know, it's not all doing math. Part of it's doing math. It's not all feeling emotion. Part of it is feeling emotion. So maybe when you clunk together these single purpose AIs into a whole, maybe they can do enough that they started looking like AGI. Oh yeah. I think that, I think we're not there yet. We don't have the architecture for AGI yet. So a lot of people like think that the current breed of language models can lead there. I don't think so. I think that Lindu needs to actually update the architecture and, you know, creating something that is close to like a sentient thing, is actually pretty hard. It's even harder than rocket science actually to create. Oh, so sure I think this is part I mean, of we, we have rockets. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's actually even harder. And But I do think that we do not need to have that in full in order to be useful. So my philosophy is to build useful things that we start using. And iteratively, we're going to add more and more functionality until we get to something that is, say, like the level of intelligence of a dog or of a cat. And that is maybe actually good enough for what we actually need for most applications. Um, I think that, you know, with all the hype, that there is a lot of hype, but there's, it's also being backed up by actual results. And this is what gives me hope that it's accelerating. So as you said, for example, AI nowadays can also help you develop parts of AI. I use it. Sometimes I have like six hour long sessions, like literally chatting and developing code together with an AI. It has been an absolute, you know, productivity enhancer because it allows you to have like an expert um, who do, AI does make mistakes actually when trying to do code. Um, yeah. So you really still need to know what you're doing, but you know, at an advanced level, you start realizing the limits of this. For example, if you want to create something that is pretty straightforward, AI does a very good job at it already, even current AI. Um, when you try to invent something new, it does make mistakes and you do need that human creativity. So that is something that is still missing, I think, from the current AI, that spark of creativity. How do you create something totally new that's not in the training data? Um, but I think these problems will be overcome, actually. And... And I have good hope that in the next two, five years, this stuff is actually going to change a lot. So, you know, expect to see AI that can actually reason a little bit, that can also use logic, not just neural networks together. This is what I'm working on, in fact. So what I'm working on at the moment is called neurosymbolic AI, which combines... Say, say that again, neuro... It's called new, neurosymbolic AI, neurosymbolic. Wow. So this is going to be the new architecture of AI in which it combines the flexibility of neural networks, which have been fantastically successful at identifying patterns in data at learning automatically, but also combining logic. How do you infer something? How do you deduce something? How do you actually take symptoms and assign them a cause the other way around, basically like doctors, do, for example, medical doctors. And you know, all this together is going to lead us to an AI that can actually think and reason like we think. For example, when we explain something to someone, we say, okay, it's because of A, because it's B, because it's C. There is always this cause and effect, this chain of logic in the way that we speak. And this is important, but AI doesn't actually really understand this currently. So this is something that, you know, once we actually overcome these barriers, mm -hmm. it's going to become much more effective at interacting with us on a daily basis. This is this is fascinating. I think I think I was actually reading about this. Is this the AI that can do math proofs? Yeah. yeah so so basically so basically 
um, uh, not just maths proofs, but I mean, that is something that you could do, but I don't know if you've ever used like chat systems to do like simple solutions. Sometimes you can input queries that are like really complicated and you get a perfect answer, but sometimes you get, you know, stuff made up. And we weren't used to this just, you know, up to two years ago, we always thought, you know, I was, I grew up, you know, watching Star Trek, for example, and Spock. Mm -hmm. And so I always had this image in my mind that the computer would always give you an accurate answer that you can always rely, especially yeah. when doing something. Mad. Nowadays, you know, it's make stuff up. And this isn't on, like you cannot have systems that just lie or make stuff up. Because we're used to rely actually on the information that the computer gives us. So it's like misinformation plus lying, which is kind of okay. Um, uh, where is the value in that? So I think that the problem of what is called algorithmic hallucination needs mm -hmm. to be resolved before you know we can actually use, for example, LLMs in regulated industries, before we can actually use it for machine critical applications. And this is a very important view, which is also being adopted by a lot of governments around the world who are putting regulation and also control requirements on AI. How do you make an AI that is reliable and trustworthy? It's a fascinating topic. Okay, we're, we're, we're being very theoretical and I love this stuff, but you're, you're also a very practical guy. And here you are in Dubai and I know you're involved in projects and you've done things in the past. Can you tell us about your commercial applications of what you're doing or the industrial applications of what you're specifically working on? Yes, so, so basically I'm focusing on, on fintech applications just because we needed to have, so created this new type of AI called hybrid intelligence, which is based on neurosymbolic AI. And uh, it is suitable to make applications for regulated industries or, or industries where you need to make a decision, where you need to make some form of impact on human life. So for example, if you're controlling a plane, if you're making loan decisions in a bank, or if you're making you know, decisions that affect people directly, you need to be able to explain them. You need to be able to have trust behind them. So yeah. effectively, what I'm focusing on are commercial applications where the decision-making process needs to be explained by the AI. You need to be able to have the AI justify why did I give a loan to this person and reject another person and be able to explain why. So FinTech is uh, one of the first focus applications and we are basically creating applications for um, banking services and insurance and other regulated um, uh, companies who are working in the financial services industry. Interesting. And then, the, um, I mean, you're normally in Malta and Malta, I think is reasonably cutting edge with some of this stuff, but you're here in Dubai also. I, I'm gonna ask a loaded question, which is that, how would you compare the two environments when it comes to AI innovation? Well, I think I see the, the Dubai and the UAE and also the Gulf region as, as a whole um, as a very innovative forward-looking region. In fact, I'm here also to meet people, to also check it out a little bit and see what is being done. I think there's a lot of investment here and pretty forward-looking um, initiatives. So it's a, I think it's a good area to be um, physically, you know, to be located and also to see what is being done. I think there are a lot of projects and people are ready to invest in AI. And you could see this push for doing something really new, which I think is very refreshing. Um, as a company, my company is currently based in London and also in Europe. So we have a presence in the UK, a presence in Europe, and you know, looking forward to expand, you know, to see what the Middle East also offers, because I see so many new projects and people are willing to actually put money into this project where they there are. is real innovation. And this is so refreshing. Um, I'll, I'll introduce you to him. And I mentioned it before, and it doesn't hurt to say it where we can say it. So I, I'm, uh, one of my colleagues or friends is Ian Arden, and he's involved in the Mempool uh, Ventures Group. And they're doing a lot of AI. And the, the response that they're getting here in the Gulf and the projects they're working on it is really really interesting. So I'm going to connect to you guys because he's got his own crew of people who are very much into this. And I think, I think it'd be very synergistic to get you together. So that'll be at this Iftar on Friday. By the time we publish this video, I don't know if that'll be live or not, but we'll, 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 we'll see. Yeah. It, may have already, it may have already happened, but you know, then all of you can like, you know, try to come to the one next year. Um, yes, you're right. The, I mean, you were seeing, I think, I think the UAE either came out with or drafted its first AI law. It was ahead of the curve with everyone it is which is impressive um 
it kind of follows what they're doing in other areas like crypto is I think I'm sure you're aware that Dubai came, has its own regulator, VARA, Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority, that came up with its own rules. It's the first, as far as I'm aware, the first regulator entirely dedicated to crypto. It's not a, it's not a crypto section of the Securities Authority. It's its own regulator. It's something kind of unique. And I'm, I'm noticing that these smaller, more nimble jurisdictions are engaging in regulatory competition or regulatory arbor, arbitrage, not, not necessarily by allowing things that shouldn't be allowed or being edgy, but by simply having rules that you can look at and not wonder. So I think, you know, I, I heard you mention regulation as, as part of this. It's it's a fascinating topic. It, and also, it, is AI something that can be regulated? I mean, is it, it seems so amorphous and changing and varied. And, you know, I don't know the difference between AI and computer science exactly i mean how, how do you how do you define the topic well enough so they can even regulate it oh yeah so this is actually a hot topic because if you over regulate something that is new and yeah. changing all the time there can be dangers actually in that so you want to promote innovation while you know preventing really bad use cases of the technology so you know there are obviously bad things i know if i take a robot dog and i put a weapon on it and i just send it out in the street that obviously should be bad you know i mean there are some things that are obviously not on if i take an ai program teach it i don't know um viral dna and try to create some kind of super infectious virus that's also obviously something that should be banned so there are yeah, some things that are obvious. Do not try this at home. These are examples. Yeah, do not try this at home on your lab. Um, so those things are obvious. But then there are less obvious things which need to be regulated. For example, if you have an AI that is actually taking decisions that impact your life, for example, the loan application, um, I think people, citizens, need to be actually protected from that to know the reason why. You can't just have an AI just says no and doesn't explain to you why. So I think people do have the right to know, first of all, that they are dealing with an AI, not a person. And so the AI needs to identify themselves properly that it is AI generated. And also to be able to explain the reasoning, the decision making process. If an AI cannot explain itself, to me, it is not fit for purpose, you know, for anything I thought, you know, producing poems or like something like that, that's okay. But if it's taking a decision, um, imagine like you're not going to let yourself into an airplane that is being flown by an AI that cannot actually tell you why it's, you know, like pulling left. Rather well, than okay. Right. And now I'm going to push on this. I'm going to push on this one. There's two separate things. I'm going to be a lawyer. There's two separate things. There's three separate things. Is number one, can the AI explain? That's number one. But number two is, am I the one who deserves or has a right to that explanation? That's not necessarily the same thing. And you know, if I apply for a loan at a bank and they accept or reject me, they don't necessarily owe me any explanation as to why. Necess all right. It's it they may owe the management of the bank an explanation, or they may you know, they may not you know. But it, so we're imposing on AI an obligation that we don't impose on humans. I mean, the the bank doesn't have. Well, it. well you're raising very good points. You know, um, so I, I, yes, I want to. And you know we're looking at these AIs right now, and I, this is a common thing. We, we don't necessarily know how they work, but they're still producing useful results. And sometimes, the, the you know just because they can't explain it, that doesn't mean they're wrong. And are we going to change the, 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 the problem with that? Yeah, the problem with that goal is that um, if you're using it in an application where it has actual impact, and you don't know whether it is wrong or not, you need to be able to check. And uh, you're right, like it doesn't need to always produce the explanation to the end user, to the end client. But you do, as say, for example, a bank employee in this case, you do need to be able to get that explanation so that you can then decide, am I going to pass on this explanation to the customer? Maybe I redact it, maybe I get a summary explanation mm -hmm. um, or not give any explanation at all. But if I, as a bank, as a regulated industry, as a regulated entity, um, get asked by a regulator, why did you take this decision or why didn't you take this decision? You'd be able to back the decision up. Being able to actually justify that is very important. And I believe that everyone has the right to be treated in that way because otherwise we're going to have the so-called black boxes. So AI right now is kind of like a black box, this mysterious model that no one knows exactly how it works. 
you cannot have that if you're going to allow AI to take decisions on our behalf. You need to be able to explain. Just, just as if, you know, like a person actually makes this decision, you need to be able to ask them why, and they will be able to justify themselves. So otherwise, we're going to end up with systems that make these decisions. No one knows how they work. And we're going to be able you know, to, to not actually be able to explain why. And I think this would be a very big problem. Um, liability yeah. problems. I mean, you can think of even more problems than, than I can uh, from a legal aspect of- Oh, oh sure, I mean, you know, the AI of, of the the surgery, I want to yeah. know why it did what it did. Was it a mistake or was it real? Yeah. yeah. I, 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 you know, I or, or the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Imagine a diagnosis. Like if, if you go to a doctor, you ask them, you know, you, you describe your symptoms and they just give you, you know, a prescription and just don't explain to you anything why they think, you know, you have whatever condition they think you have. I mean, you're not going to trust such a doctor, basically. Well, so, okay, now, uh, I'm sorry. I, did, did, I, I love you so much and it's so interesting. I, I'm going to kind of go back at you. There's, look, that's not necessarily true because if the human doctor can explain and cures cancer 50% of the time, an AI doctor can't explain, but cures ni cancer 90% of the time, maybe I'll take my chances. You know, maybe, you know, this is what, an evidence-based treatment where you don't know why it works, but it works. I mean, a lot of medicines like that, not, maybe more than we care to admit. We don't know why this drug handles this, this group of symptoms and this people and not this people, but it seems to. And are we not, are we going to not provide the treatment because we can't explain it? You know, I, we're, that's, that, you know, scientists can't explain a lot of things, but you know the phenomena happens. You don't you don't deny the well, phenomena because you can't explain it. So I, I, again, when, of course it's tricky. If I'm applying for a loan and I'm black and I get rejected, I want to know that it's not racism. You know. Yeah. For example. For example, but you know, there's other cases where I don't necessarily need to know. I'd like to know. You know, please, AI doctor, explain why this drug works on me. But if it works, it works. Well, it depends on your definition of explanation. So if I have done, you know, like a lot of clinical trials and I know that a particular drug works for a particular symptom, that in itself is an explanation, is a justification. You know, I mean, if this drug works 90% of the time and I recommend it to you, I can cite that particular study or data and say, okay, like 90% of the time, this is successful and this is why I'm prescribing it. That is a form of explanation. But, you know, just randomly coming up with a prescription and like telling you nothing, just take this. I don't know why, because my model says so. I don't think you're going to trust that particular um, recommendation, or at least I wouldn't put in something without any explanation whatsoever. But, but do, you, do you see what I'm saying? It's a, suppose that was the case. And sorry to beat this to death, but it's just a, it's a fascinating question. Suppose that's the case. But then the technicians come to the room and go, look, we don't understand it either, but it's right 99% of the time. We don't know what's going on, but for some reason it's right. And here's 99 other patients that trusted it and they were right. And here's the one patient who didn't trust it is dead. So we can't bring him into the room. Go for it or not, you know. But, but you know what? In that case, you are making the decision. So they are giving you that choice. So I think it's wait, important wait, wait, that- wait, wait, Good point, good point, good point. I, I acknowledge that's a difference. Yeah, so, so basically in those kind of situations, I think that is a perfectly fine example when you are presented with the choices, when you're presented with all the information available and then people get to make a decision. I think that is actually pretty fine. But say, I don't know, 99% accurate, you don't want to be on a plane when the, you know, the autopilot lands the plane 99% of the time. I think you don't want to be on it in that 1% of the time. So, you know, and, and you know, it's funny you say that because planes land by autopilot and yeah, and these mechanical devices are not explaining to the pilots how they're landing. They just land. But no, actually, you do get, you know, no, you, you do, you do get um, uh, exact feedback, in fact, um, on what the scope sure, got. But, hey, look, yeah. I, I don't want to. This, this could be a two-hour conversation, and maybe we'll do that. So these sort of ethical questions, or these sort of philosophical questions, are they being applied to the projects you're doing in fintech and in these other areas? Do, do you go into this kind of stuff? Yes, because, for example, with the, the European Union, for example, recently has passed the EU AI Act, which is going to be in force. 
Um, this is actually very important, in fact, to get it right. I mean, how do you ensure that high-risk applications in AI are done in the right way, in the right yeah. way that you don't get abuse of data, for example. Um, uh, say facial recognition, you can use it for good ways, but you can also abuse of it. So I think this is where I think regulations are important to actually just make sure that the obvious blatant cases are not actually done. And when it comes to explanation, for example, if I'm in a car um, that is driving itself, let's say, for example, it has backed down and all of a sudden stopped. I want to know, you know, to have an explain button that it actually tells me, okay, why did you do that? I want to be able to do that. And also ideally to be able to teach the AI, okay, you're right or listen, you're wrong actually on this. AI, please update your model. And this is how you should do it. And I think this is very important that we can directly teach the AI and directly influence it. Interesting. This is a fascinating conversation. Um, let, me, let me shift again. Since you're in Dubai, um, who do you want to meet and who should meet you? I'm here to actually meet people who are innovating, who are actually in the financial service industry and also in other industries to see, you know, kind of the innovations that are being made here, the new projects that are being made and uh, to see where the trends are going in the region. Okay. You know what I'm going to do? Because you're here to the 17th. Was that correct? Yes. Okay, so I'm actually going to publish this video early just so we can push it out to our groups while you're here, and hopefully that will generate a lot of meetings. Like I mentioned, I'll, I'll get you and Ian and Mempool together because they're great and you're great. I, I, I just know if I put you guys in the same room, something good is going to happen, but you're you're such a fascinating person. Uh, I, I want people to be able to reach you while you're here, and hopefully they'll they'll do that after this video. So in the show notes, we'll, we'll include your contact information. Um Boy, there's a lot. There's a lot to cover. I, I took some notes when we were talking before. The well, well we're kind of going there. What, what, what is the future of AI? Just to wrap it up, what's the what do we see the next two, three, four, five years? Yes, I see AI that is uh, will create a new breed of AI that is based on what we're seeing today on chat systems, mm -hmm. but that will have the ability to reason. I think this is very important. So the ability to reason, the ability to work out, you know, simple logic and also create complex things, being able to plan, being able to create a plan of goals and objectives and tasks of how to actually execute that plan. And I think the last one is the explanation part, being able to explain in an auditable and verifiable manner. I think those three things are going to be key. And we're going to see a lot of developments in those areas, which is going to make AI more useful and more fit for purpose for all the different applications that want it to be um, used for. So, you know, AI is here to stay. I'm gonna, I think that there will be many more applications of AI than what we're seeing now. And I do see entire industries being disrupted because of this new application, this new application of AI. Um, and also AI will hopefully will enhance rather than replace people. It will just make us more productive and hopefully have more time to do more creative things. Or, you know, who knows, maybe we'll have more free time to actually enjoy ourselves more. Yes. Uh, let me add another possibility. Well, let me add another possibility without disagreeing with you. Uh, I just had another doctor, Dr. Adele Emissary. I'm Esri. I'm mispronouncing his last name, but I'm sure you know Dr. Adele. I just had him on the show and he, he raised a very interesting idea, which is maybe AIs in a way make us smarter. Um, and to use your example, even when they're wrong, you know, if, if we're chatting with them and they make stuff up and they're creative, sometimes they, they come up with ideas I didn't actually think of. And then they, they take, you know, when I'm using ChatGPT, it takes me down a new path and it doesn't have to be right or wrong. It's just something that a human conversation partner wouldn't have brought up. And I'm like, yeah. oh, that's interesting. Uh, and it kind of enhances my brain, you know, and there's, there's this fear that AI is going to make us stupid because it's going to do the thinking for us. But maybe it's almost like a, a thinking partner sometimes, like a brainstorming partner. And the, the, there's something that happened a few years ago that really struck me. Um, I'm sure you're much more familiar with it than I am. But there was this competition with Go, that ancient Asian game. And the AI, yes. you know, it's, it's much harder than chess. And the AI beat the Go master and it did it with a move that from the Go master's perspective was like an alien intelligence. It was right but it's not a move that a human player would have made because no human ever thought about doing it that way. But once the Go Master saw that move, of course, it opened up a new way in the Go Master's way of thinking. Of and now that 
AI move is part of human move. So in a weird way, we're enhanced by interacting with AI. You know, and I, I never would have saw that coming. That's, that's not Gordon being smart. That's me having heard about this. And now I'm open yeah. to the possibility that AI will yeah. teach us new things. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think, I think as, yeah, I think as with anything else that is intelligent, you can use it to learn actually and to practice. So yeah, I do see AI as a kind of like a sparring partner that is going to open us up to also new ideas, brainstorm. I use that. I use it a lot actually to brainstorm. To get, you know, even though in most of the cases when creating new things, it is kind of me who is actually putting the direction, the planning into it. But it does open up your eyes to alternatives that maybe you didn't consider. I mean, in a way, it's like a very efficient research assistant that is going to give you ideas that mm. maybe you, you would have found on your own, but you would have spent so much time to find on your own that it is going to make you much more productive and efficient. I had interestingly a conversation with uh, Anat Anatoly Karpov on this, on, on AlphaGo and other systems. Alpha, he yeah. was the chess grandmaster, basically. He won um, uh, the chess tournaments for a number of years. I mean, he's one of the most best known chess players in history. And uh, we were talking about this, like, how do you think like an AI? And there, it's, it's kind of like an alien way of thinking because it starts kind of from the very end and then works its way backwards. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, this is how also a number of chess grandmasters work. They just can't explain it, but possibly there is something that maybe some people may do think similarly to an AI. And for those people, the current AI tools are going to be absolutely great in order to be able to show them ways um, solutions that maybe they didn't think about or maybe are not so obvious. And I think this is going to become much more common um, uh, to actually have AI giving us ideas that maybe then we follow up on. And kind of this iteration, this collaboration between AI and people, I think this is what is going to make us really, really give the best results. Um, we call it hybrid intelligence. Some people call it augmented intelligence, but it means the same thing, like the collaboration, the not having AI replace people, but as a tool, a very advanced tool, as a kind of co-collaborator, a co-pilot with you that is actually getting best results from you. But, and but you say co-pilot. You know, yeah. Microsoft must yeah, love you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm thinking also, you know, I'm not 12 years old. I'm from a analog, I was born in a semi-analog time. I think the responsibility of people like me and maybe maybe you, I don't know if we're in the same demographic, is we need, our, our job is to be intellectually and emotionally and ego open to the idea that we it's desirable to partner up with an artificial intelligence and not to resist it. To be, yes. you know, because this idea of I can do it myself or I need to human or, you know, it's, it's like, no, just go with the flow of, what's not being made available so that you can compete and thrive in the 2030s. Exactly. Interesting times. I think it's gonna be an exciting future and uh, I'm so happy to be part of actually building it. You're in the right place. Actually, if you're going back and forth between the EU and GCC, you're, you're God bless you, you're in the right place. And we're, we're thrilled to have you. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna cut it just cause we're at time, but I'm gonna do my best to introduce you around in Dubai and publish this video quickly. And I, I any, anyone who's watching this, if you are interested in AI or want to have a very interesting uh, conversation, th th this is the man to talk to. He, he's a genius, and I'm very honored to know him. So thank you, everyone, and thank you for being on the show and making the thank time. Thank you, Gordon. We really appreciate it. And I'll stop the recording.